After hundreds of billions of dollars spent and four decades of intensive research, cancer remains one of the most vexing medical challenges in the world. Why and what needs to change to finally conquer cancer? That's the focus of the new book, The Truth in Small Doses, Why We're Losing the War on Cancer and How to Win It, by Clifton Lee, my guest, author, and contributing editor to Fortune Magazine. Welcome, Cliff. Hi, Peggy, thanks to, for having me. Yeah. So Cliff, I'm a cancer survivor. You are too, you had Hodgkin's lymphoma, I understand, uh, as a teenager. Uh, what is there about that experience that led you to conclude that there's something wrong with how cancer research is done? Well, actually my experience was incredibly positive. You know, I was treated at the NCI during a time of, an explosive time of collaboration. It wasn't until I started looking at it as a business journalist that I actually suspected that we were losing. And in fact, I had actually thought we were winning at first. <laughs> Until you did a little more research yeah. on it. And one of the criticisms you made in your book as to one reason uh, you say we're not winning is that most of the federal dollars for cancer research goes to the same institutions year after year. Uh, expand on that criticism a little bit. Sure. Now, you know, there are some great quality institutions who do, you know, amazing work and, and they deserve a, as many dollars as they can get as far as I'm concerned. But it says something about the peer review process that the same institutions get the money um, year after year. And it's not just the top institutions. If you go down the list to the top 100 or two, 300, you'll see that their relative places on the list doesn't change. And it seems as if there's an unseen hand um, directing some of those dollars to the same kinds of programs that we've seen over and over again. And what are those programs as, as far as what's the issue of how those programs operate that you think could be improved? Well, a lot of it is old-fashioned hypothesis-driven science, which is, is good science. Um, but the idea, the way it's manifest is often young re researchers have to figure out some small little discrete problem in a very small uh, experimental system and they have to find a question often that doesn't really relate to other questions and so they work in isolation they don't share their data and in the end what we end up having is 70,000 papers on p53 which is a you know a, a gene or 40,000 on mic another uh, cancer gene and so none of that stuff is, is put together in a broader sense of what the cancer process might look like. In, in your book, uh, you have some specific examples of innovative cancer research, a different way of doing this. Give us an example. Well, I, I, one of the issues I'm going to talk about tonight, or stories I'm going to talk about, is a guy named Dennis Burkett, who was this one-eyed surgeon, uh, a missionary doctor in Uganda, who through this extraordinary collaboration did, did a epidemial, uh, a a, a biopsy, a geographical biopsy rather than a tumor biopsy, where he went looking for people's memories rather than tumors. And in that, he was able to solve one of the great mysteries in, in all of cancer. Um, you've said that the emphasis on understanding how cancer forms, how it grows, how it's spread, isn't necessary to cure it. Um, how come? Well, it's necessary probably to cure it, but it's not necessarily necessary to reduce the cancer burden. And when I think about the cancer burden, I, I think about it not just how many people are dying of cancer, but how many are getting cancer. And so we really have to reduce that aspect of the burden. That number has grown about three times the, uh, the rate of the population growth, if you look at just cancer diagnoses since 1970. And so many of those people are treated and over-treated, and we haven't done really anything to prevent people from getting cancer. Uh, you talked about innovative sort of cancer research mm -hmm. in your book. Um, how do you balance the ethical uh, concerns yeah. of, of doing something maybe outside of the box and of reach? Uh, yeah. For instance, the doctor who invented chemo probably wouldn't yeah. have been allowed to do that right. uh, today. How do, you, how do you do risky research and are still ethical? That is the great question. It really is. Because if you go back and you look at Sidney Farber, who developed that first you know, uh, chemotherapy regime for, uh, ch for childhood leukemia, ALL, I mean, what, if he did that today, he'd probably be thrown in jail. I mean, it was completely against what our, our, our standards are in terms of, of patient protection. Um, and you can go down the list of, of some of those early pioneers and say, well, this was really pushing the edge. Our challenge really is to figure out a way to get, to make the current system more open to, uh, to experimentation and allow 
uh, and crunch the time it takes. And so if, if things don't take as long in terms of clinical trials testing or in terms of academic research, we can afford to take more risk because the cost is less. All right, well, there's certainly a whole lot more in your book. Author Clifton Leith, thanks so much for uh, joining us. Thank you so much, Peggy.